Welcome again. So I'm going to uh, talk about the coordination of non-communicating mobile robots. Um, uh, in fact, uh, most of what I'm going to uh, present here is, uh, well, not it's only not due to me, but also uh, uh, we had a joint work uh, in doing this uh, with, a, with a colleague of mine from uh, who is now, uh, who used to be in Netash, but who is now in uh, Fenerbahce University, namely uh, Ahmed Cezayli. I think I should also mention his contributions as well to this uh to this work so um well before starting um yes before yes before starting okay hold on yeah before starting talk about the mobile robots um let me first uh, briefly uh, go over uh, what the uh, social animals do uh, or how the social animals keep their coordination and their, uh, their uh, connectivity, uh, especially which is, I think, especially might be quite interesting in these days uh, when we are trying to maximize our, uh, our uh, social distance, right? So, uh, for example, here we have a uh, school of fish. It's basically a school of sardines. Uh, well, interestingly, they can move in a group and they can easily give way to other uh, larger sea animals when when they try to pass through the school and then they simply uh, get their, I mean, the, 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 the whole school of fish gets their shape again uh, back. Um, well, it, What's uh, striking here is the, uh, the the fish did not communicate with each other. Well, that's what we think, at least. I mean, there are some sea animals who can, some sea mammals who can. Sardines can uh, do this. In fact, they can't also see the whole group. I mean, what a sardine in such a group would see is just maybe a couple of tens of at most, or just a few of uh, its uh, neighbors, but still by just uh, coordinating itself according to their positions of their neighbors, they can achieve a group coordination. So uh, another uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, species in that respect that is in informing uh, in, in group coordination is, well, you all know the, uh, the, the, the birds. Uh, so that's a we, that we call a flocking, uh, it's a flock of birds. English is an interesting uh, language. So for different, um, for different animals, you have different types of um, uh, word, different words to describe their uh, coordination. So this V-shaped formation is quite familiar uh, for uh, birds flying long distance, and it is said that they that that sort of a formation minimizes their um, their uh, power to to stay uh, on uh, uh, airborne. Uh, and uh, well, in fact, there are different. Uh, research investigations about how uh, birds can achieve that or in what way uh, that optimizes uh, the, 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 the effort they, they, they uh, show to stay uh, airborne. Right? Um, so that's, that's another uh, interesting coordination for, from the animal bird. Well, I'm sure you, most of you, uh, saw this before in uh, Facebook or other social media. This, well, in this case, that, that these are again birds, but we do not say something, uh, we do not say that they are flocking. That's, I think, should be called a swarm. Um, it's, it's a swarm of birds. In fact, these are uh, star starlings. In Turkish, we call them sırcık, right? 
So they are they they can easily form such formations. And it's interesting that, that I mean they they can uh, do funny things like uh, they, they they can they, they are merging uh, they are splitting the, the the whole small into two and then they are uh, merging them back. So, uh, so that that's another uh, social behavior or social. Uh, coordination, or it's another coordination of uh, animal groups. And last, uh, we have a herd of sheep. sheep. Well, uh, so that, that's, the, that's another type of coordination after uh, school, schooling or flocking, uh, swarming, and this type I would call herding. Well, uh, yes, they, they uh, obviously the sheep is trying to stay connected, but they are doing a little bit more than that. They are sort of minimizing the, the distance with the neighbors, so they they try to be as close to uh, to each other as possible, uh, and still trying to obey the constraints put by the road on which they are traveling. Right, and well, in fact, as uh, in many uh, areas of uh, science and technology, also. Swarm robotics uh, benefited from such uh, from the mimicry of such uh, animal groups. Um, in fact, what I'm going to present in a while is more related, or I mean, the behavior is more uh, inspired by the I think school of fish. So before proceeding further, I, I think let me first start with the. Uh, well, I mean, where we, we, we may need uh, swarm robotics um, because uh, there are many cases where rather than using just one manipulator, just one robot uh, or one uh, mechanical or electromechanical device with relatively larger capabilities, you would like to use smaller but many uh, units to, to do the same uh, job. Uh, obviously, that might bring you some fault tolerance, some um, uh, ease of production, maybe, but it also brings its own problems to be solved with, right? For example, in underwater exploration, well, the, in this uh, the small uh, clip, you see three uh robo fish as they are called because the uh, at the university of uh, george washington following uh, another uh, robo shark uh, and trying uh, well, they, they are trying to do this uh, as a group uh, motion well underwater has one uh, important constraint in in such group coordination because uh, wireless communication is quite limited in underwater uh, environment. So uh, in many cases, you have to uh, you have to use uh, or you have to rely. Uh, you you can't rely on any communications at all. So each uh, member of the group should be as autonomous as possible and should be able to apply its own strategies. Right. Transportation or construction is. Um, is another uh, application area for swarm robotics. Well, on this clip, you can see two drones. In fact, there are also some other more, some more uh, drones around here, which are uh, uh, doing some transportation and some construction work. Um, well, um, in many cases, you might use drones more than one to, to carry some relatively larger object from one place to other. And whenever, uh, although they, they carry objects in, they might be carrying objects individually, the drones should be uh, coordinated uh, whenever they are sharing the same environment, of course. Mining is another possible application uh, for, uh, for group robots. I wouldn't say swarm there because swarm generally reminds people uh, of uh, much more, um, I mean, many number of uh, agents working together. In mining, you have, well, just one, two, three, I mean, definitely more than one, but not more than maybe 10 
uh, mining robots working together, but in a mine they have to travel together to the to the to the place where they have to dig and they uh, load their uh, whatever they they dig dig out uh, in the mine and they have to come back and all such things require group travel and group co coordination also in in mining. Well, obvious application area is another one. Uh, military reconnaissance patrols. Well, the the picture on the uh, on the left is um, reality. Even Turkish army uses drone uh, unmanned uh, or uh, swarm uh, swarms made up of unmanned air uh, vehicles. Uh, well, not only maybe reconnaissance, but also they are uh, used in assault operations throughout the world. Unfortunately. Well, the, the, the right-hand picture is um, it's, it's fantasy, but it's close to reality because now the robots are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, I don't think we are far away from an idea of having a, a robot mosquito. Um, uh, probably we should be also uh, we should also get used to uh, uh, such an idea maybe in the near future. Um, Another um, uh, possible application I would uh, I would mention is well uh, while we are talking about smaller and smaller robots now they are getting so small that well the medical micro robotics is an important area uh, in in swarm uh, or an important application of swarm robotics where uh, for example. Uh, the most of the robots, in fact, a little bit smaller um, types are also called nano robots. Well, I mean, beyond the micro robots, um, they are usually of uh, such uh, flagella type uh, agents where you have a, uh, a, a small plate as, as the head of this flagella and then the spiral shaped um, tail. And, uh, and uh, well, in order to, to, to move them, you would need to rotate a magnetic field around this, uh, around the body uh, in which this flagella is traveling. And that in that way, you can, uh, you, you, you will be able to uh, apply a torque on this uh, metal, at, so that you can rotate the uh, spiral uh, connected to the flagella, and in that way the uh, the flagella can move forward. That picture com compares the uh, compares the uh, flagella with the, uh, with a human hair, right? So it's much smaller than much thinner than the human hair, and it, I think that here we also have uh, a comparison with the human red blood cell. So you can, I mean, there you can meet, have small flagellas as only as big as, uh, or as small as uh, blood cells in our bloodstream, right? Okay, so um, yeah, uh, let me now from, after all this introduction, let me, uh, let me briefly uh, give an outline of what I'm going to do. Um, by the way, um, I assume that you can um, uh, you can connect with your microphones uh, well, uh, and uh, so please do not hesitate uh, to to to, co to connect and then to to break me if you would like to ask anything at any time, right? Because uh, well, but. The, the 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 bad thing in, in, in such webinars is that sometimes you lose whether you are still I mean you lose the feeling whether you are still connected connected to to uh, tens of people uh, who are listening to you or not. So I, I I hope my my picture I mean my presentation and my voice is uh, is is coming to you, right? Hocam gayet iyi. Okay. Thank you very much for the feedback. Okay. So, 
Um, so that, that's going to be the outline. So I, I would like to talk a little bit about the problems associated with uh, group coordination. Uh, and I would like to explain a little bit more detail what our aim was, for, or why we are motivated in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a research about non-communicating coordination. And then, uh, well, uh, I, I would like to define the group connectivity from a, a graph theoretical point of view. And then I would like to define our problem formulation, which is not going to be so much graph theoretical. In fact, the, uh, the most, uh, the, or uh, an interesting comment I, I, I can say about what I'm going to talk about is that it's basically, uh, provides to a graph theoretical problem a solution which is not graph theoretical. That may sound silly, but that's, I think, at the end of the day, what's going to happen. Okay, so the connectivity theorem is, is, is an essential result I would like to review. Uh, I mean, our uh, contribution to this uh, area, our contribution with uh, Ahmed, uh, the, my colleague I mentioned just a while ago. Uh, and this theorem uh, will lead us to a local st steering strategy where, which can be applied by each and every individual in the group to, to maintain, a, uh, to, to achieve a, a collective objective. Um, there are some implementation issues, especially some computational difficulties here, which uh, can be easily overcome. And I will, before the conclusions, I will show some simulation results. Okay, so uh, what sort of uh, research is going on about the uh, group coordination since the last maybe 10 or 20 years? Well, uh, first of all, the main issue is the connectivity. I mean, before doing any anything else, you, you are concerned about the existence of the group. So you don't want to, uh, I mean, if you, if, the, if you do not have a, a connected, uh, uh, agent uh, uh, agents, uh, if you do not have connected agents, then you wouldn't have a group at all, right? So the con connectivity, the integrity of the uh, group is the, the, the main concern here. Um, and then you can think about different problems like uh, formation control, that is the group should or might be expected to move in a certain uh, shape like a certain attack shape, a cer I mean, uh, it must be in, uh, aligned in a, in a specific way, et cetera, or it might, it might be required to be in a um, circular shape, et cetera. Right? Um, there are also interesting problems related to king recognition, especially when different groups are sharing the uh, the same environment, right? For example, in a construction uh, which is done by uh, I'm uh, by diff uh, by several uh, robot groups. Uh, I mean, they, they had to know who is on my team, who is not on my team. This problem is little, in fact, a little bit more interesting. It should be interpreted differently in a military setting. So, if two robot groups or two robot swarms are attacking each other, you have to make sure that uh, you, you have to recognize your kids, your, your friends uh, with a, a very high degree of uh, reliability. Um, well, navigation in the presence of obstacles is also a problem to be investigated uh, as it is in the uh, motion, in, in controlling the motion of the uh, individual robots as well. Um, well, uh, you might be, uh, you might need sometimes to split and then again to merge a group. Well, obviously, especially splitting uh, contradicts the connectivity idea here. So you have to be able to break the connectivity as well, but in a controlled manner. That's, uh, that might be a little bit tricky. Um, and you have to apply whatever you do, all these strategies or what. Uh, all these algorithms, which are, um, which may be, which may provide solutions to these problems in a distributed way, because I mean, 
sending all your information to a central body and then processing it in there and then sending it back uh, might be quite problematic and quite costly. Uh, so uh, all this, whatever solutions you, you provide must be implemented in a distributed way. So the uh, agents in the group are going to be uh, are going to do whatever computation or whatever uh, behavior is necessary. Uh, they, they they should decide them on themselves, or they have to distribute. They have to contribute to the computation of such strategies. And you might expect uh, a, a fault tolerance. Well, what happens? What what will happen if a robot breaks down? Um, the other uh, robots in the group should somehow recognize that while well, there's something wrong and should be able to leave it behind. Well, again, something that contradicts the, 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 con the connectivity. Um, you, well, they may not be able to see each other every time because they may you may have occultations. That is, one robot may hinder the line of sight of another one. Well, if the swarm is quite uh, crowded, for example. And of, of course, you would expect some robustness with respect to measurement errors. Uh, in, in doing all this. Right? So there are different interesting problems here to, to search for. Maybe you can take this as a note for, uh, for I mean, the, uh, the graduate students we have in this seminar, in this webinar, uh, may take this as a note for uh, as uh, research ideas or recommendations as well. Um, yeah, so our aim is, is in fact, or what I'm going to present, I mean, the, 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 the algorithm we, uh, I'm going to present here is aims, in fact, to develop simple local strategy to ensure connectivity in mobile robot groups that do not have communication capabilities. Well, why not? I mean, because there, are, there may be several reasons you don't want or you cannot communicate. Well, sometimes you don't, uh, you can't communicate because uh, of the, uh, payload and energy constraints. I mean, as we said, everything is getting smaller. Also, the robots are getting smaller. But just if you think this robot mosquito, well, in such a case, of course, you would hardly have, uh, well, the, the power and the, 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 the battery power uh, is, is quite limited, would be quite limited there. And you would not be willing to spend this limited power uh, for communication, right? That that might be one idea. Or the environment we, would be so harsh that you cannot communicate, like uh, the underwater environment, for example. Um, uh, but there may be there might be also other uh, constraints uh, or the other difficulties in communicating, uh, especially in military uh, or security. Uh, from security point of view. Your communication may be jammed because of the enemy party, because of the, 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 the opposing party in, in your area. So th there might be a jammer to, to hinder the communication. Um, or there may be, you might have your own reasons not to communicate uh, because uh, you, you want to disguise yourself, right? You, you don't want to communicate because the, the, the other, the opposing party, the enemy might detect you, right? So you would like to be silent. That's another possible uh, case in a military scenario. But uh, it's uh, interesting that this connectivity issue is in fact, is an assumption in many works rather than uh, uh, providing a solution. I mean, most of the algorithms assume that the, the group is connected and then develop their algorithms around this uh, idea. But uh, if you look at the, how this connectivity is, uh, if you look at how this connectivity is assured, well, in one way or another, you came up to uh, ideas where you need communication, especially graph theoretic approaches to, for con connectivity require some sort of information exchange either among the group members or with a central body who is going to process all this information. Well, let me, uh, let me uh, 
talk a little bit about this graph theory, what graph theory tells you as much as connectivity is concerned, right? So that, that's a group, for example, of five agents, five robots, or well, it's basically five vertices where you have uh, links or edges connecting them. That's as, well, that's how you interpret a group as a graph. Well, uh, there are two important matrices you can define on such an uh, undirected graph. The first one is the adjacency matrix. Each row of the adjacency matrix shows you to which uh, other members or to which other vertices of the graph is a vertex connected, right? So for example, R1 is connected only R2. So that's why we have uh, the second element on the first row, first row belongs to R1 as a one and all the other elements are zero. Or uh, for example, R3 is connected to R2, R4 and R5. That's why I have the second, fourth and um, fifth elements on the third row as one and the others are zero. You see the diagonal will always be zero because you, you, you do not assume that each vertex is connected to itself. So the, the self-connection is not defined in such a graph. So uh, on the other hand, if, uh, for example, for R5, uh, which is connected to R3 and R4, we have the fourth and fifth elements in the adjacency matrix, uh, in the fifth row of the adjacency matrix as one. Right. So that shows you the what is connected to what, in, in, in other words, in your graph. The other one is the degree matrix. It sh simply shows you, it's a diagonal one. The diagonal gives you uh, the number of connected uh, edges for, uh, for, for so connected vertices for each and every other vertex. So R1 is connected only to one other vertex, so one. So for R2, we have two connections. For R3, we have three connections, right? Three links and so on and so forth. You see, in fact, if you add the rows in the adjacency matrix, that gives you the diagonal on the degree matrix. Therefore, uh, the Laplacian, which is defined as the differences of these two matrices, D minus A, well, uh, will, if you add all, uh, all elements uh, in a row, uh, you, you are bound to get a one, right? Because the diagonal is the number of elements uh, connected to each uh, agent, and the other elements in the in this row is uh, denoted as a minus one whenever that particular uh, uh, agent is connected to 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 the to uh, the one which belongs to that row. Okay, so that's in fact uh, an important result here is that this Laplacian matrix is always positive semi-definite. Semi-definite because, well, in other words, uh, because if you multiply uh, this matrix with a vector of one, 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 but a non-zero vector, so you obtain a zero uh, vector. So there is a vector with which, which if you multiply this matrix, that gives you a zero vector, which means that L is uh, singular, which means that it has, only, it has at least one eigenvalue as zero. And the, well, you can also show that the other eigenvalues are not negative as well. So, um, well, in fact, I mean, the, the, the smallest eigenvalue will be zero, of course, but the, uh, the, the, the main result about the connectivity in graph theory tells you that a graph is connected if and only if the second smallest eigenvalue is non-zero. So lambda one is zero, for connectivity, you need the, uh, the second uh, smallest eigenvalue to be non-zero. In other words, that means all other eigenvalues are non-zero. Well, in fact, um, this, uh, the smallest second eigenvalue is also known as the Fiedler value uh, after Miroslav Fiedler, uh, Fiedler uh, a Czech uh, mathematician who introduced all this uh, theory to the uh, graph and who did uh, some work about the group connectivity, it's also known as the algebraic connectivity of the, of the uh, group. 
uh, and in fact, it also is a, it's this lambda two is a measure of how much the group is connected. So the larger the second smallest eigenvalue, the more are the number of connections in the number of links in a group. So therefore, to increase the connectivity, you try usually try to maximize lambda two, uh, or at least to establish connectivity, you need a strategy which is directed directed to make the, uh, this uh, lambda two uh, strictly positive, right? So you see, it's, it all depends on the second smallest eigenvalue, which is a holistic property of this matrix. I mean, by, a, by an information which an agent we, uh, can retrieve only from its neighbor or neighbors, you cannot know the shape of this uh, Laplacian, you cannot know the, the uh, overall uh, elements of the Laplacian. So therefore, what you need to do is, well, you have to process all this information you obtain from a group in a central body to solve this maximization problem um, and then provide a solution for you, which, which leads the group or which maintains the group connectivity. That's why I'm saying uh, the uh, Graph theoretic approaches, uh, in fact, um, need some sort of some sort of information exchange, some sort of collecting all this information in a, in a, in, in in one place to, to process an algorithm directed towards or aiming uh, group connectivity. You can implement this algorithm in a distributed way. I mean, the computation might be distributed among the group rather than referred to a uh, central uh, outside body. But even in that case, you need communication. You need information exchange between the group members. So coming back here to the, our motivation, well, rather than following a graph theoretic approach for the non-communication, uh, in, in cases of non-communicating uh, group members, uh, we, we, we try to uh, mimic the behavior of uh, animal groups, but especially, I think, school of fish. Uh, yeah. Well, we don't have much time, so let me proceed a little bit faster uh, and give you uh, this problem formulation. But uh, our assumptions are the following. So we have a group of mobile robots, which are assumed to be identical and without labels. In other words, you cannot distinguish between two different robots. Um, if you have snapshots of uh, their positions uh, in, in several, for several time instances, you cannot say who is traveled where, right? Just uh, everybody has, everybody is the same. They, are, they have identical physical properties, the capabilities, and they, they are not distinguishable one from uh, another. What they have, well, they cannot communicate, but what they have uh, is um, limited range, relative position uh, sensors with bounded measurement errors. Right? So they can sense, they can measure the position of their numbers within a certain range. And they have bounded measurement errors, meaning that, for example, if R1 somehow perceives or senses the R2, well, not erroneously, maybe not in the exact position, but maybe somewhere here. Well, that you it can do with yes. It, there will be some angular error, and there will be some radial error as well. But we know that they will both have some uh, bounds. Well, the, the bounds are known, right? So bounded uh, measurement errors means uh, something like this. Well, they do not communicate, they don't want to communicate, or they cannot communicate with other robots in the group. So no information exchange. They are omnidirectional. They can move in any direction, um, uh, which is uh, not an, uh, which is a correct assumption for many land robots, for example, nowadays. But you can also assume that uh, they have limitations on their motions as well, but that's going to uh, not contribute to, to the essence of our uh, algorithm. It, it's going to bring some extra more constraints maybe in uh, organizing your motion, but that's not really uh, a, a loss of generality. I mean, if you assume that they are 
omnidirectional. Uh, they are not simply points, but objects having special extension. Because in many uh, in many research, usually you assume that you have points in space. And if you are talking about the swarms uh, or any type of uh, group behavior, but well, what I mean, special extension especially uh, can can mean the following. For example, consider R1 here. So there are several other. Uh, fellow robots around uh, around uh, it, and it can uh, uh, they are within the measurement range. They, it can sense all the robots around here. But the problem is here with, with these two robots. I mean, uh, if especially for uh, especially R1 is using a, an ultrasonic or laser proximity sensor, probably it's not going to sense or it's not going to know that there there, there are two more robots. Uh, behind this uh, uh, this shadow of the, this robot that is closer to it, so uh, that may also may or may not be the case in a visual uh, measurement. I mean, if if this uh, if this position information is of the nearby robots are obtained with an optical camera, that may or may not be the, the, the case. But definitely for a proximity sensor of ultrasonic or laser uh, based on ultrasonic waves or laser that that's going to be the case right and finally the group it has a leader and follow robots well the, 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 the word leader is not exactly the, maybe the correct here uh, because we assume that they are identical right uh, well the 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 leadership is hidden. That is, no, nobody knows who is the leader. In fact, the leader itself doesn't know that it is different than the other robots because, well, the only difference that a leader the, is, is that uh, it, is a, it is given the trajectory. I mean, if the group is just beyond preserving its connectivity, if it has to move from one place A to another place B, somebody has to know the trajectory. That's why the leader is there. But otherwise, uh, it's uh, the uh, that nobody knows who the leader is, and that doesn't affect the local strategy, or that doesn't affect how the leader contributes to the uh, to the behavior uh, with other robots. Um, yeah, I think to solve this problem, we need to define a subgroup pertaining to each robot. Because after all, every agent is going to collect its own information from its uh, relying on its position sensor, which has some uh, uh, the given range. In this case, we consider a range of Bmax here. So, and each subgroup of uh, if, uh, dedicated to each agent in this group is in fact simply uh, containing the robots or the, the agents in this group. So we define an S1 uh, that has only R2, but on the other hand, R2 can uh, see R1 and R3, so S2 will contain the subgroup 2, uh, which is affiliated with R2, is, is going, it will have R1 and R3, and so and so forth. So R3 has or S3 has R2, R4, and R5, and R4 can sense R3 and R5, and finally R5 can sense R3 and R4. Right? And uh, well, the once you define all the subgroups, now I think we, we are ready to present the uh, the, the 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 main theorem. Uh, let me first uh, just note a, a, make a note of notation here. Well, x sub k super i of t is will be the position of r sub k in the coordinate frame of r i. So you see, k refers here to the robot. So which robot? The position of x is a position. It's the robot. It's the position of the k robot. But of course, each robot has its own coordinate frame. Each robot determines or uh, perceives other fellow 
members in the group uh, as on its own coordinate frame. So it's uh, the, the, the eye is, in fact, uh, showing whose uh, coordinate frame uh, we are talking about. Obviously, X sub I, super I is zero because each robot is at the center, at the origin of its own coordinate frame. So once more, X sub I, super I of uh, T is always zero. So the coordinate frame uh, of each robot is attached to itself and moving together uh, with the robot. Um, well, I'm going to define two sub, uh, two partitions uh, in this uh, subgroups. Uh, well, uh, rather than explain these inequalities, maybe I should only explain this, uh, this uh, term here, x sub i, super i, well, obviously that's the position of the i vector as defined in, the, in its own coordinate frame. Well, usually well, at the time t, that will be, of course, zero. But if you consider the time t plus delta t, so that's the uh, that's the uh, will then define the position of the i vector, uh, which is planned for t plus delta t. That is delta t seconds later in its own coordinate frame. In other words, this is the local target of the i robot in its own coordinate frame. This is where the i robot is planning to uh, to be towards which point it is moving so that it's going to be there at uh, after delta t seconds, right? So that the local target, I think, is the most convenient way to describe x sub i super i t of delta t. Local target for, uh, uh, for delta t seconds later. OK, rather than explaining this, uh, this um, uh, inequality or the subgroups, let me just show them in, in this, well, what they mean physically. Let's assume that this is the local target of R1, right? So X1 super one of T plus delta T is here. That's where R1 is heading towards, right? Well, in that case, SP would be all the robots in this, in this semicircle, and S1Q will contain all the robots in this semicircle. In other words, SP is, well, I mean, if you uh, lose the speaking, if you define this direction as front and this direction as the back regarding the motion of the uh, robot here, S1P is the, uh, the, 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 the robots in, the, in, 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 in S1, which, are, which R1 is leaving behind, and S1Q are the robots in S1 towards which R1 is heading, in other words. Right? Well, that brings us to the connectivity theorem, which says, well, in a group of autonomous mobile robots which are connected at T equals, so if you are initially connected, then if you obey this uh, constraints, then you can uh, preserve group connectivity for all T. Right, so it's all boils down, boils down to these two constraints. Whatever the robots uh, are doing, they have to obey these constraints. You see, the constraints are on the magnitude of the local target. So they have to be moving in such a way that whenever they, to whatever, wherever they, they are going for uh, delta t seconds later, they have to be they have to constrain the targets in, the, in that way. Again, I think rather than, uh, well, first, let me skip the proof here, right? but because the, the physical meaning of these two constraints are more important. Again, our R1 fellow, and let's assume that it's going to move in that direction. Well, in that case, the, the first constraint says that, well, the, the first constraint is uh, uh, related to SIP or S1P in this case, right? So the first constraint tells you that, well, just choose the, uh, the, the, the uh, robot in S1, which is farther back uh, or which is farther away in S1P. And whatever the margin of this robot, uh, whatever the, the difference between this, the position of this robot and the maximum sensing range is, just use half of it as your constraint. So do not move 
more than this yellow piece, which is which is in fact simply the margin between the position of this far robot that's farthest away and the uh, ultimate sensing direction. Right. The other one is the second one is related to S1 Q and well, you can simply state it that in such a way that. If, assuming that they are not going to move, assuming they are fixed on their positions, do not move more than uh, so that you are leaving them, uh, you are taking them to your P region, right? Um, yeah, well, with all this strategy, in fact, what we have here is now, yes, uh, we have some, uh, uh, we have some, um, uh, constraints, but you see for each direction, this P and Q regions are different so that this constraint effectively define an amorphous region around R1 uh, in which R1, R1 is allowed to move freely. And it can use this degree of freedom by, well, in such a way that by possibly minimizing a cost function so that uh, it can uh, fulfill other uh, tasks. Like, for example, um, uh, formation, to, to build a formation. So the follower robots move towards a target location, to a local target location, which minimizes the cost function, right? Well, of course, it should be related to relative positions of the robot in, in, in its group, because that's the only available information for this robot. Well. The leader, if it knows the navigation trajectory, again, obeying the same constraints, it can follow this navigation trajectory, right? So what sort of cost functions you can use? Well, for example, you can minimize the distance to, the, to your maximum uh, farthest away, to the farthest away uh, neighbor. Well, that's quite conservative, that's, I think, uh, will uh, give you a behave group behavior which is similar to the sheep we have seen at the beginning. Because it's going to crowd all the group together in 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 a small region. Another cost function, so which is in fact trying to minimize the differences uh, from all. I mean the 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 differences of the distances to all your group uh, subgroup members. Uh, from a desired distance d0. You see, this cost function is uh, zero if uh, a, a, a robot is uh, at a distance of d0 to all its uh, subgroup members. So if everybody is standing at a distance of d0, that, that would be zero. So it's d0, you can, I mean, using this today's terminology, you can define it as a so desired social distance. So just keep away at D0 meters, right? Um, well, I'm going to skip this as well because that, that's an important uh, problem. That is, what if all these constraints give you that, uh, that the local target, the, the distance, the magnitude of the distances of the local targets are zero for all robots? Which, because that means nobody can move. Well, under certain mild conditions, you can uh, easily achieve that, uh, that this, uh, that there is not going to be a deadlock. Especially this cost function, which I introduced just a minute ago, in fact, fulfills this uh, conditions, right? So, uh, I mean, maybe this corollary makes much more sense. So for a group of robots that are connected at zero, everybody is fine to start with. If you are using this cost function or for this for your local string strategy, then the, the deadlock requires that either the navigation space is a proper subset of RN or there are infinitely many robots in the group. So if you do not have infinitely many robots, that which is not possible in, in practice. And if you do not have any uh, areas 
any forbidden areas, I mean, if the robots can move freely throughout the whole RN, throughout the whole uh, n-dimensional net uh, uh, space, then you are guaranteed that you won't get any uh, deadlocks. And of course, there are many problems with uh, respect to the implementation because uh, while minimizing cost such, let me go back here, minimizing such cost functions under this nonlinear constraints is, is a nonlinear optimization problem, which might be quite difficult to solve. But you can always uh, go for a suboptimal solution. That is, you can simply use a gradient descent uh, algorithm that is you can move in the direction of the negative gradient of your cost function uh, uh, which uh, which is sufficient for all practical purposes let me show you a couple of uh, a couple of simulations here um, well here we have a group of uh, 10 robots uh, where the sensing range is 13 units and the desired distance are uh, for, for this uh, cost function to be minimized is just 10, right? You see, uh, the, the, the robots quickly acquire, the group acquires a shape and hardly changes this shape, for example, during the whole travel. Again, the, the leader is shown here just uh, for our purpose, I mean, for our recognition. Nobody knows who the leader is, and the, the leader simply the only difference is that the leader itself uh, uses another cost function. That is the cost function that minimizes the difference between its uh, position and the desired trajectory. So it follows the de desired trajectory. Um, yeah, but if you increase the num, uh, the the if you decrease the distance, again thirteen uh, is the distance. The, the uh, sensing range is the same, but now the desired distance is just seven, much smaller. So you have a much more excited, much more agitated uh, group. So the, the, the shape is not so, uh, the, the shape changes uh, quite fast during the travel, but something you might or might not uh, prefer. Um, and you see, the uh, the uh, the uh, algorithm is quite democratic, so anyone can join the group as long as it minimizes this. It 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 uh, uses the same strategy, like these two uh, separate robots, which are at the desired distance to each other, and this one, which is alone. So whenever the whenever they sense other robots in this group, they simply join this group. Uh, so it's uh, the I mean the, you can simply use this algorithm to to uh, while traveling around to connect all your group members easily. But you see, just uh, one uh, addition to the group, uh, just a small turn can uh, interestingly agitate the uh, motion of the group members in an interesting way. Um, let me, yes, let me introduce, uh, just to finish uh, things here, let me introduce another uh, cost function. Well, uh, this one is aiming, in fact, is useful in uh, keeping the, uh, the, the group members in a line. So if you use this uh, cost function, if, you minim if everybody minimizes this cost function, the, there will be a, a lineup of, of the group members on this given direction, the, the direction defined by the uh, vector, unit vector uh, E sub L. So, uh, for example, you can use this idea for a, a rescue operation, where, I mean, search and rest, search operation, where uh, the group is lining in a, uh, in a, uh, direction that is perpendicular to the uh, motion of the leader so that they can uh, search a given area uh, just moving uh, in, a, uh, 
in the line, right? Um, or you can switch from one uh, cost function to another whenever you have to pass through a narrow uh, passage, uh, which the group cannot uh, pass, uh, well, if, if it is using this cost function, but the, uh, it can pass whenever it switches to a line. Um, and back again. So by switching from different cost functions, you can uh, you can uh, manage different types of behavior. Um, maybe I can. Uh, yeah, that that's the similar idea with uh, ten robots now. Now again, back to the other cost function, and then back to the line formation to, 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 to pass back from the other passage, and so on and so forth. Or you can use different directions for this line formation to make the, uh, to, to flock your robots, just like flocking birds. Okay, so it's been almost an hour, I think. So uh, I, I might be a little bit uh, long, but let me just uh, summarize everything just by stating these conclusions uh, fastly. Uh, so it's, I try to introduce a simple and uh, local string strategy to ensure group connectivity in uh, for uh, swarms. Uh, there's no communication, there are no hierarchy. so. Everybody implements similar uh, similar uh, strategies. There is nobody knows, nobody regards anybody any other robot as a uh, leader or so. Well, it's inspired by animal behavior, and it you what you need is only limited range position sensors which can cover you all your uh, all the region around you at 360 degrees. Uh, newcomers are accepted to to the group. Well, I think it's like. Uh, Hotel California, so uh, you can easily join the group, but you can never leave, I think, <laughs> because of the uh, assurance of connectivity. Well, uh, somehow I skipped that, but there, there are no risk of any deadlocks, so you, the robots can travel in any case. So, and well, yes, uh, the, also you, uh, the, you have some robustness against occultation, uh, visual occultations uh, between different robots. Okay.